Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. Israel's critics across the international community have time and again condemned it as an apartheid state, claiming an analogy to the South African regime which set its policies on racial separation. During today's program, we will challenge this analogy, and to do so, I'm joined here in the studio by Professor Hillel Frisch, who is a senior research fellow at Bessa Center at Bar Ilan University. Welcome. Hi. I'd like also to welcome our TV7 analyst, Mr. Amir Oren, and Dr. Roni Shaked, who is a researcher at the Truman Institute at Hebrew University, Jerusalem. Welcome. I'd like also to welcome Ms. Paula Sleer, who is the Middle East Bureau Chief at Russia Today. Welcome. Thank you. Mr. Oren, give us a broader or opening uh, on the matter of this topic. Analogies are uh, obviously always superficial and sometimes dangerous. Um, you have uh, racial segregation de facto uh, in the United States in several uh, places um, which remained from the Jim Crow area of separate but equal. Obviously in Saudi Arabia, um, Muslims have the uh, predominant uh, role by law. When you talk about apartheid, one should remember that um, in areas under Israeli jurisdiction, there are uh, three basic classes of people. There are citizens of Israel, Arabs, Jews, and others who enjoy equal rights. There are residents of Jerusalem who are Palestinians and have uh, voting rights in municipal elections, but not in the uh, general national elections for the Knesset. And you have uh, more than 2 million Palestinians under military rule, which should uh, be temporary until a peace deal is signed uh, with uh, a Palestinian state. And then they will get their full rights as citizens of another country. But when you talk about apartheid, it is not only a separation or distinction between two ethnic groups. It is also a case of a minority ruling the majority, ruling over the majority. This is not the case in Israel proper. One may claim that in the territories uh, east of the so-called Green Line, where there are less than half a million Israeli settlers and more than two million Palestinians, the Israeli settlers enjoy privileges which the Palestinians do not have. Professor Frisch? I don't even understand the assumption, and I'll, I'll try to explain it. Um, re regarding them, Israeli Arabs, they have full citizenship rights. There are Arab parties. Um, their socioeconomic development since the statehood is unparalleled anywhere in the world. I'll just give you one example. In 1950, they had on average one and a half years of education compared to seven years for the Jewish community, a gap of six years. Today, the gap, today the average on the, uh, Israeli Arab already has 12 years of education, and the gap is a half a year between Jews and, and Arabs. This, is, this kind of socioeconomic development is, un, is, is absolutely unparalleled almost anywhere else in, in, in the world. So they have full citizenship rights, and Israeli Arab members of Knesset speak freely and antagonize um, most of the Jewish constituents on a daily basis. Now, regarding the Palestinians who are not citizens, they're fighting, they're involved in a nationalist struggle, a struggle between Palestinian nationalism and between Israeli nationalism over control over the land of Israel, when many of them, at least half of them, as aspire to destroy the state, the state of Israel. This is totally different from South Africa, where blacks wanted to live together with whites, but it was whites who separated themselves from the black majority through, uh, through tremendous constitutional and legal systems. And, and one thing they never had was the right to vote. Dr. Shaked? First of all, thank you. And when we are talking about apartheid, we are not talking about the Israeli Arabs, as Professor Hillel Frisch said. The Israeli Arabs are with full, full rights in Israel. We have here a judge that sent the president of Israel to jail. He was Palestinians, Arab, Israeli citizen. 
But that's not a problem. But when we are talking about the West Bank, when we are talking about the Palestinians, about the conflict, our national nation, national ethnic conflict with the Palestinians, I'm 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 afraid that if we are going to be a bio-national state, we are going slowly, slowly toward apartheid between the Israelis who are living there and the Palestinians in the West Bank. Even though, as you just stated, there is uh, quite uh, equal rights among Arabs living in the state of Israel, so why would one population equal to another in a different area that, uh, ethnically speaking, receive different treatment than another in a different uh, area? Because in the West Bank, and again, as Hillel Free said, there is a conflict. There is today a big, big uh, a problem about the West Bank. Who's going to be in the West Bank? According to the Palestinian, that's going to be their land. According to the Israeli people, I don't know what the Israeli people wa uh, want, but this land is under discussion between the Israelis, Palestinians, and the world. All the world is not accept that Israel is going to annex the, the West Bank. So the people there, they don't have any rights today. You are going to find their people even without any citizenship. Not mm. Palestinians, not Israelis, not from, I don't know, not Jordanian, and nothing. And on the other hand, there are some, for, for example, I'm going to give you the, the beginning of the, of the way of thinking. For example, there are some roads in the West Bank just for Jewish people that Palestinians cannot drive. For Israeli license road. plates. With the, just the Israeli license uh, plate, yeah, there are. But that's not a problem. The but pro isn't that a matter of security concerns with yeah. regard to... That's, it's that's, less that's so over racial it's, segregation. It's because security, okay. and not just security, it's because of the conflict, mm -hmm. of the national ethnic conflict between us and them. It's because security, and because the conflict is leading us to separate from each other. And because the conflict is so, as I said, with so hatred in the hearts of the both people, from Jewish side and from the Palestinian side, mm -hmm. the, 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 the people are perhaps afraid from each other and we need here some measures in order to to, 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 I don't know if you're for security reason or for others, but the, 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 the problem that in the world Outside of the world, everybody thinks that this is the beginning of the apartheid. Well, uh, Miss Lear, you've been a young journalist during the apartheid years <laughs> in South Africa. Uh, uh, you are South African yourself as well and have had the opportunity to live through the transition from the apartheid state in South Africa to uh, the South Africa we know today. To what degree do you see an analogy, if at all? Look, nobody really wants to say that Israel today is perfect. We have problems of racism. We do have problems of segregation. But the difference is that none of it is enshrined in law. And that's the fundamental point, that in South Africa, apartheid was a system that was enacted with laws of racial segregation. That does not happen here. When I grew up in South Africa, I went to a school that was only for white children. Here in Israel, if, if you an Israeli Arab or an Israeli Jew, you have the opportunity to go to schools. You can choose where you want to go. We were segregated. Whites would live in one area and people of color would live in another. Here in Israel, you can choose where you want to live. So although you have these very real problems that perhaps Israeli Arabs feel that they're treated like second class citizens, it's not enshrined in law. And I would argue back to what you were saying, that what is happening in the West Bank is an occupation, it's an oppression, but it's not necessarily apartheid per se. I think the security reference you made is very, very real. In South Africa, the African National Congress, which, was, which is today in power and was leading the struggle for liberation, its policy was never to carry out terror and violent acts, with very few exceptions. Israeli concerns are undermined by cons security considerations. So you have, for example, the, the barrier or the wall that people so easily call the apartheid wall. But it was set up because it was trying to stem the suicide bombings. We never had car rammings. We never had the kind of attacks and terror that is common here in South Africa. And so it's unfair to make the analogy and say that because of security concerns, the practices that Israel is implementing, it is implementing because it wants to segregate two people according to the law. No, it doesn't. At least I don't believe it does. I think it really wants to protect its citizens. Mr. Oren? Um, it's very confusing um, for an outside observer 
what uh, seems natural to people who live in Israel, who grew up into this reality and uh, understand it um, even uh, without having to talk about it, uh, should be explained um, in broader terms uh, to the outside observer. When the State of Israel was set up in 1948, adjacent to it should have been a Palestinian state. This is what the United Nations Resolution uh, 181 decreed, and it was outside of Israel's control to decide whether Jordan, the uh, kingdom, the Hashemite kingdom of Transjordan, would annex the West Bank, which it did, or whether indeed there would be a Palestinian state in which the residents of what is now the West Bank uh, would live as uh, equal uh, rights Jordanian citizens. Now, within the state of Israel, as it was supposed to be set up, there was a very tiny majority of Jews some 650,000 Jews to more than half a million Arabs or Palestinians. So Israel, had the Arabs not been driven out or had they not uh, 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 fled. fled because of uh, some um, agitation by their leaders or outside forces, uh, we don't know how Israel would have gone on uh, to live. However, when the State of Israel was uh, finally established following the War of Independence and only a tiny minority of uh, Arab state, there was a military administration in the areas where Arabs were concentrated. Up until 1966, Israeli Arabs did not enjoy equal rights to those that Jews enjoyed. However, they also did not have the same burden and still do not have the same burden of serving three years of military conscription. So whether it balances uh, each uh, other or whether it cancels uh, the other side of the ledger or, or not is open to interpretation. But they do not have the same privileges, neither do they have the, the same uh, duties. In the West Bank, the problem is the Israeli settlers enjoy all the rights and privileges of Israeli citizens living across the Green Line. But the Palestinians do not have the same rights. So this causes this confusion of, of so many um, uh, variables, so many classes of citizens. Professor Frisch? I'd like to beg to defer on two points. Most Palestinians in Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, live under a Palestinian authority that calls itself the state of Palestine, and they enjoy a lot, a lot of subsidies, a lot of international aid that Israeli settlers don't. And in fact, I would beg to, as, an, as a settler myself, that it's much more difficult for a settler to expand his home than it is for Palestinians. This is the first time so, I hear so, that, that the settler uh, envies uh, uh, his yes, Palestinian uh, neighbor. Uh, um, uh, um, uh, 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 yes, they do. The, okay. uh, the, the second point, uh, which you inferred until 1966 why Israelis were why Israeli Arabs were under military rule is the second crucial difference between South Africa and Israel. Israel, while it's dealing with the Palestinians and the Palestinian problem and this national ethnic problem, is also dealing in a very bad neighborhood. In, an interna in, into a, in a regional and international setting, which is very problematic. Um, Israelis are very, very reluctant to be appeasing to the Palestinians when, the, when there's the rise of Iran that preaches the destruction of the state. And these two things are linked. This is the crucial difference between what happened in South Africa, where you didn't have an external threat, or the good, or the um, uh, the agreement in in um, Northern Ireland, which where we are, which has no, we are now celebrating its twentieth its twentieth um, anniversary, mm -hmm. which succeeded in 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 bringing about the end of violence, although not the end of tensions between the two communities. South Africa did have Angola with Cubans. It, ah, it, it did it have, it, whether it was a pretext, whether it was a real security threat is, is uh, something else, but it could point to external threats too. Dr. Shaket, however, I'd, I'd like to ask you the following. When we're talking about uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, we're talking about a time of war, uh, a distinct difference between South Africa to, Israel, uh, to the situation in Israel today. Uh, 
to what degree can this analogy then be implemented when we're talking about an ongoing conflict to a judicial issue that uh, implements itself as a policy of segregation? First of all, I wanted you just to emphasize, I'm not saying that today there is an apartheid. There is the first sign of apartheid in the West Bank. Mm -hmm. And uh, it said uh, the, apartheid, the apartheid, it's not just what you are doing, it's also what you are feeling. I don't see Palestinians going together with the, with the Jewish people in the West Bank dancing or love story. There is no love stories between Jews and, uh, and Palestinians at all. You don't need a law for, uh, for, uh, for any kind of a relationship between Jews and Palestinians. They don't love each other. That's the, that's the problem. And the minute that the Israeli government is talking about the future it's, and talking about the West Bank as part of the state of Israel, what's going to be with the two and a half or 2.8 million Palestinians? Okay, they are living in a state. If you want to call it a state, call it a state. You can call it a state. But it's not just a state where you are, they are living. Somebody from Jenin, Palestinian from Jenin, who wants to come to Jerusalem or he wants to come to Hebron, it's going to be much easier to fly to Amman and to go back from the Allenby Bridge and then to go to Hebron, then to, uh, then to drive through the West Bank. That's the, 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 the problem. And the problem is that they are using, the, the Arab countries and the Palestinians are using this situation to, to teach the, 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 the Arabs and, and to, to put it in the media that we have here an apartheid and we don't have an apartheid. Yes. The wall is not an apartheid wall. I'm happy with the wall because it's psychological border between us and the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. Ms. Lear? I mean, I don't agree with your one comment, with all respect, that apartheid starts with a feeling. I think if you look at South Africa today, arguably there's no apartheid. But I have to be honest and frank, you walk around South Africa, it's not that all whites and non-whites are the best of friends. And mm -hmm. you certainly get that tension in other countries. So I think apartheid is very specifically a reference to South Africa's legalization of racism. And I think that's the problem. I think it's worth discussing also why the term exists. And the term exists, and it's banded about particularly by the BDS, the Boycott, Disinvestment, and Sanctions Movement, to delegitimize the state of Israel. Now, this can be another conversation as to why they're trying to do that and, and is their ultimate goal the destruction of Israel. But the point is that by making the comparison with South Africa apartheid, you delegitimize the state of Israel. And it's such a popular catchphrase. People will say the apartheid wall without actually understanding Understanding that it's not an apartheid war, that it is act, that it was actually set up as a fence or a barrier or whatever you want to call it for security purposes. It was not set up to racially put into law mm -hmm. separation between two people. So I think it's important to understand that the term has become very popularized in recent years with the rise of BDS since 2005, and it is an attempt to try and maybe whitewash a lot of, of what's going on in Israel. And a lot of people who use the term actually don't even want to have the discussion as to whether or not Israel is an apartheid state. State. They prefer just using the catchphrase. Mr. Owen? Uh, three points in brief. One, regarding the wall. The wall was not set up uh, when the Oslo process started, but rather some seven years later, after the terror attacks, the suicide bombings, which Paula uh, recalled, and the right wing in Israel resisted it because under Ariel Sharon, it marked the end of Israeli expansion. Uh, for the Palestinians, it was too far into their territory. But for the Israeli right wing, it signaled that Israel is not going to be there any, any further. The other thing is, Israel defines itself as a Jewish and democratic state, which means that one ethnic group has, in Israel's version of a constitution, the, the basic laws, has a dominance over all others, which opens the way for a discussion on whether it is racist. Uh, and in order to, do, to delve into that, one has to define what is a Jew, which is uh, uh, an internal debate within uh, uh, Judaism. The, the uh, third point uh, has to do with Israel's relationship with South Africa up until 1990. Uh, because South Africa under the uh, white regime was a pariah state. But Israel needed France uh, because of its existential problems. And after the Yom Kippur War, uh, in particular, 
Israel looked wherever it could find some help, no matter what the internal regime is. Israel had a close military and industrial relationship with the South African apartheid regime. And um, through guilt by association, it also became contagious. And Israel, uh, in the mind of uh, uh, American students, boycotting South Africa at the time, uh, became comparable to South Africa. So one has to remember this historical experience, but this doesn't mean that Israel itself is an apartheid state. In that sense, Israel is no different from any other country in the world. The United States had a wonderful relationship with the Franco government in Spain, had wonderful relations with a host of, of dictatorships, um, I, I mean, uh, and, and in fact, stopped the denazification program in West G Germany and elevated many former Nazis because of the Cold War and the need to, uh, to contain or the perceived need to contain the Soviet Union. So that state interests don't take into account um, the moral, um, the, the, the moral um, elan or the moral flavor of the, of the regime is, 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 common to all, is common to all states. But I would like to point to the lie of BDS, because if they call Israel apartheid, then it's apartheid in Kashmir, it's apartheid in Kosovo, it's apartheid, maybe st still, maybe in in Northern Ireland, and it's it's apartheid in anyone in any area where there's lots of ethno national conflict, and there are many areas in the world with ethno national conflict. Now, the the wall, the separation wall, they in fact as nationalists should be pleased by the separ by the separation. But why aren't they pleased by the separation w w wall? Because the greatest amount of economic welfare West bankers, Arab bank, West bankers receive is access to the Israeli labor market to work in Israel, where the wage differential is 100%. And that separation barrier prevented many from working in Israel where they really wanted to work. Dr. Shaked? I want to go back to the, to the, uh, to, to the Israeli Arab Palestinians and the West Bank. When we are talking about other countries and when we are talking about Israel, the state of Israel, not the land of Israel, I'm not going to talk about apartheid. On the contrary, I think that as you said in the beginning, we have here a lot of rights to the minority here and the situation is not so bad. Not so bad. On the contrary, it's, it's much better. But when we are talking about the West Bank, all the words is talk, uh, looking at us as an occupation. And if we are talking about occupation, that's another thing. That's give the BDS the power to fight against us. That's give the, the, the other countries to demand from us to give equal rights, even to the Palestinians who are living in the West Bank, although there are some security problems. And people don't understand the problem. And if, I said, the Israeli government was much more smarter than today, and they are going to to use even propaganda to the world to show that there is no uh, uh, no no uh, no no uh, apartheid here that was another story but they are not doing it because again this government and the the right wing government is talking about annexing the west bank and when we are talking, but would that not force and the israeli the government world, in order to implement those uh, equal rights you're talking about yeah, and the, the, not equal rights. And look what, what they're why saying. Not? Because the people, even the people in the government, while, while they are talking about annexing the West Bank, they are talking about giving rights, some rights to the to the people there. But what not would all the change, uh, uh, Dr. Shaked? What would change? What would be the difference between uh, an Arab who was uh, part of the Palestinian uh, uh, mandated uh, Palestine uh, pre-1948 to a Palestinian that now was annexed into the Israeli state. Well, what's the difference between the two people considering that the moment that the Israeli government annexes Judea and Samaria and the West Bank as a whole, uh, the Jordan Valley, 
they would also be subject to Israeli law. They are not. Go- they are going to be subject to the to the Israeli law, but they are, they will not have the the rights as the as the Israeli is citizen. And then and nobody is talking about giving them citizenship. People are talking about giving them some kind of autonomy, something like this. People are talking to give them some rights in the. In, 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 in under the, the the Palestinian rules, I don't know what, but not to give them full rights. And if they're going, if the government is going to give them full rights, I'm going to be the first man to stand in the demonstration Ms. against Nier? it. I mean, at the moment, though, we stay, we're in a situation that's an occupation, and an occupation is not apartheid. So it doesn't matter where we go in the future. If we, we're debating the whole topic of is Israel an apartheid state, you cannot argue because we have an occupation, the country is an apartheid state. I did want to throw something in, and I'm, I'm not being... Shortly. Shortly. Um, for people who use the apartheid analogy, it does point to frustration of what is going on on the ground. It's an unfortunate analogy to make, and there are reasons why they make it, but at the same time, it needs to be understood that particularly left-wing, left-leaning Israelis who also talk about an apartheid Israel, I would hate to think that they want the state of Israel not to exist. But sometimes it's out of frustration and actually just an urgent need to try and see the government here behave in a different way that people make the analogy. Mr. Owen, uh, the word apartheid, the Dutch word apartheid, which was adopted, of course, Afrikaans is very similar to Dutch. Uh, it was uh, implemented in order to insinuate the separation between the two races. This apartheid, of course, uh, the words, the separation, is also the goal of the international community with regard to the Israeli-Palestinian problem. When we're talking about the establishment of two states for two peoples, we're talking about substituting uh, an allegedly one form of apartheid for another form of apartheid, which would be legal in the international community. To what degree is this perceived in this way, if at all? Uh, it is not perceived uh, in this way because a territorial separation is different um, uh, than a, um, an ethnic one. Now, uh, in Israel proper, there are uh, several sectors uh, who prefer to live only among themselves, religious and uh, ultra-Orthodox uh, and, and others, and you have uh, various communities in which members want to live among people like themselves. So this is not uh, uh, identical uh, to apartheid. The problem is, uh, within Israel proper, you have three Jews to one non-Jew. In the Israeli Knesset, you have nine Jews to one uh, non-Jew. There should have been no problem, but those right-wing and religious politicians who are afraid that down the road, in 20 or 40 years, the uh, demographic balance could, could change, want to uh, legislate uh, a new clause which will ensure uh, Jewish dominance forever. This could be a form of apartheid. Well, unfortunately, this is all the time that we have for today, and this is a topic that we should and will revisit in the future. I'd like to thank Professor Frisch for coming here today, Mr. Oren, Dr. Shaked, and Ms. Lear, and I'd like to thank our viewers as well, and we'll see you next time. TV7 Israel's mission is to give you, our viewers, truthful information, which in effect will give you a chance to really understand what is happening in Israel and its region. If you are blessed by our programs and believe our mission to be important, we urge you to support us and become a voice for Israel. You can support us by going to our website at tv7israelnews.com. This program was made possible through your donations.